Welcome, Emmanuel X, and welcome, Shai Wozner. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for, for doing this interview with us. We are very happy to have you here. Very nice to be here. Great to be with you. So this is a special moment for, for us. I mean, it's a special moment because we're doing the interview, but it's also a special moment because Arnold Schoenberg has just entered the um, Hainler catalog. Mm. And uh, Arnold Schoenberg's music has become copyright free in most territories um, in the world uh, in 2022. And this is why we started doing Urtext editions of his chamber and piano works. And actually, um, three works are about to be published very soon. The um, three cycles for solo piano, the piano pieces Opus 11, Opus 19, and the suite Opus 25. And we are very happy that Emmanuel X and Shai Wozner have uh, joined this project and have provided fingering for these uh, three cycles. So that's very, um, that's very special. Thank you for, for doing this for us. So um, Arnold Schoenberg's music is new to the Hehler catalog, but it's also still new for most of us because it still sounds new, it sounds modern. And I was wondering, What makes his music modern, actually? It's, uh, it's about 100 years old, so it's not really something, something recent. But still, many people think it's like the most modern experience they can have in music. <laughs> so what do you think? Why is that? Well, I, I think there may, be, there may be two factors. First of all, I think it is actually great, great music. Uh, and in that sense, great music, like the great music of Beethoven or, or Brahms, still sounds new and still sounds interesting and challenging. The Rite of Spring is an example of, of a piece that's, you know, 110 years old and still incredibly challenging and exciting and fresh to everybody. I think the same is true of Schoenberg in that way. Also, there's there's kind of an aura about him, uh, the idea of the father of the 12 tone system, uh, the radicalization of getting away from harmony, which people uh, attach all the extra musical stuff. Uh, I think uh, the name Schoenberg on a program always inspires either some kind of fear or some kind of excitement and, and love. Uh, I, think, I think it's both, actually. I would, I would, I totally agree. Um, I would also add that apart from the reputation that Schoenberg has, um, um, I think there's something about the sound that he gets from the piano. He loves this dry and sound with not too much pedal. And I often think, you know, it's kind of like the naked sound of the piano in a way. And just like when we see a nude painting or a nude photograph, you know, it's always a little bit startling at first. I think <laughs> there is a little bit of that in his sound, you know, in the piano music. Mm -hmm. nobody, nobody else quite does that, I don't think. You know, he, he's not afraid of, of exposing the, the sound of the piano without enveloping it in, in fancy pedal or, you know, he just lets it be as it is. And, and I think that's, that's part of it. You know, he takes courage to do that. <laughs> And, and he certainly had a lot of courage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yes. <laughs> so, so how did you feel when you met Schoenberg for the first time, when you met his music? Well, well, actually, maybe, maybe I should start because I'm so much older. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my first, my first experience with Schoenberg at all was was actually because uh, there was a piano competition uh, in 1974 in in uh, in Israel. And one of the required works, there was an actual required work, and that was the Opus 11 piano pieces of Schoenberg. I had never heard that music. I'd never, I, I'd never uh, seen it, but I had to learn it because I was, I was going to enter the competition. Uh, and my first attempt at it was actually fairly benign. Uh, I realized that some of it felt a little bit like like Brahms. Some of it, as as Shai said, uh, you had to think about 
lots of dryness in certain areas and, and the contrast between that and, uh, and, the, and the maybe the pedal points and the long things uh, was also very interesting. Uh, as I practiced it, it became very much second nature. Uh, it, it became a perfectly normal kind of music and very beautiful and very convincing somehow, very powerful. So you, you felt there was a great composer at work, absolutely. Shai, what about you? Um, my first exposure was actually with the suite, Opus 25. Oh, really? As a student, um, my teacher at the time made me play it. He said, you are going to learn this piece. <laughs> and I thought, okay. I, and I took a look and I thought, this is this is crazy music. What is this? You know, how is that a gavotte? How is that a minuet? <laughs> this is, you know, and then there was a switch after after a little bit. I thought, wait, this is crazy music. This is great. This is great <laughs> in a great way. This is this is you know this is so much fun and and so original. Um, and and I actually I, at first I thought, oh no, I have to I have to now what analyze this and and learn all the tone rows and and the inversions and this and that. And then I thought, wait a minute, no, you don't need to do any of that. It's just this, the energy is explosive and, and every note is, is incredibly potent and, and exciting and it's angular and it's, it's, it's just, you know, a terrific thing. Um, and so I, I actually fell in love with it after a while. And, and maybe I could, I could also add that my first exposure to the suite was hearing a recording of Glenn Gould playing it which was unbelievably exciting. And my second exposure to the suite was hearing Shy play it, which was just as exciting and fabulous. <laughs> and I, I have to add um, that the first time, um, actually, maybe even the only time that I heard it played by someone else uh, on a recital, it's not played very often, which I hope our new edition will change. I hope so. <laughs> and still, you know, as a student with Manny, at Juilliard in New York, um, I remember going to a concert by the late great pianist Peter Serkin, and mm -hmm. I remember I remember seeing the program in advance, um, and I saw that he was going to end his recital with wow. this Opus Twenty Five. He was going to end it. I mean, forget programming it, which very few people bother to do. He was actually going to end his recital, and I thought, "Oh wow, who does that?" And then, <laughs> and, and then. <laughs> I went to the recital and of course everything was great, but the suite, I mean, he ended that program like a rock star. I mean, it was, it was like he ended it with Islamay and I, I really, I'm not kidding. It was so exciting and so convincing and it just blew me away. Um, the end of that jig, I will never, never forget how he played it. And so, you know, for everybody listening, it is possible, you know, <laughs> I hope you give this music a chance. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's that's a fabulous <laughs> because I was wondering because especially the suite is so complex at least when you look at it uh, at first sight it, it seems very complicated and I was wondering do you have to know about the complexity or can you just listen to it as a as listening to a piece by Brahms or Beethoven? I would say that it doesn't hurt to be aware of what Schoenberg is doing. You don't need to analyze it note by note. Um, it doesn't hurt in in the case of this suite, you know, to just know what the tone row is because he has the B A C H letters in it, which is a. But that's more of a fun fact, you know. It's just it's an homage to Bach, but but it's not necessary for the interpretation of of the piece. What is necessary is the same thing that's necessary for interpreting Brahms, or or any of the great composers, you know. There are phrases and there are gestures. Every couple of notes are incredibly expressive, um, and and I think you you know you want to establish the character of each movement, um, and 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 to to have a certain trajectory to the piece. But that's really no different from from interpreting Brahms. And I think Brahms is very very close to this music. Oh, I think I think I agree with every word that that Chai said, and I think that's true of pretty much all of his music. I, I, don't, I don't think he intended the, the system to be the thing that people listen for. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he intended the music to speak for itself. 
So, so what's your experience in teaching this music? Is it difficult to, to convey what Schoenberg meant? I mean, how do you act as a teacher? Wow, uh, that's a tough question. And <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe not really related to Schoenberg exclusively. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know that, that you, if, if you listen to, to someone playing this music for you, I think really you make suggestions according to the way you feel about, about music in general. I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, Shai, I don't know if I'm explaining it very well. Uh, you, I'm sure you can explain it better, but you know, no, the, I... same way, the, the same way that you would be able to help with Brahms Opus 118 or mm -hmm. Beethoven Opus 110, or not be able to help, which very often happens. <laughs> uh, you know that that would hold that would hold true as well for Schoenberg Opus Eleven, Opus Twenty Five, uh, Opus Twenty Three, uh, and any of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's not not that different in terms of mm -hmm. teaching. Right. No, I I do agree. I think the the mindset that you want to approach basically any piece of music with is is you know, what's going on here? Where is the idea? Is this note related to that note or to this other note? You know, is what's the motif? And especially, you know, with Schoenberg, because it's so polyphonic and so contrapuntal, it can be easy to get lost in the web of, of, of ideas, but it's very coherent. You know, there, there are phrases, like I said, there are themes, you know, and just like in Brahms, you know, you want to see, well, how long is this phrase? Is it four bars? Is it eight bars? Yeah. And as soon as, as soon as you map these things out, your work is basically done. And all you need to do, so to speak, <laughs> is to, to bring it across. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you just need to see how the music functions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as we said, his music doesn't function that differently from, from Brahms' no. and Beethoven's. Right. And so you just so want to convey that to, to your listeners. Sometimes you feel there, there are very many indications of there are many expression marks, and uh, it's probably even more true of, of Webern than it is of, of of Schoenberg. But when you when you look at, at these, sometimes you feel like like you're doing a road map, you know, of this note should be louder, this note should be softer, and so. And sometimes uh, it's just as as Shai says, probably important to see the idea behind the, the way the phrase flows, the way, what is the intent of it? Is the intent of it to be uh, exactly five against four or is the intent of it to be rubato-ish, for example? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think to some degree, maybe one can help with that when one is teaching. Let's talk about your, your job you did for Hainle, because... Oh, um, <laughs> Shai provided fingering for the suite Opus 25, and many yes. you provided fingering for the pieces Opus 11 and Opus 19. And I was yeah. wondering, is there anything special about the fingering you you provided for these pieces? I, I would say to go back to Shai's point about uh, the, the idea of, of letting the piano speak without necessarily a lot of pedal. Mm -hmm. I think because of that, maybe you have to be quite careful about the notes that need to be held and the notes that need to be short. And you need to do that with your fingers as opposed to doing it with the foot. Mm -hmm. Probably more in Schoenberg than with certain works of, of Liszt, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the pedal in, in Schoenberg is probably more of an expressive device rather than uh, a, a, a crutch or anything like that. Uh, I think probably in, in that way, it, it's, it's good to think of, of playing a Bach prelude and fugue without any pedal at all. Yes, I, th I think um, the the pedal-less sound um, does uh, guide the fingering because you really want to make sure that things can be legato, for example, uh, mm -hmm. without relying on pedal. Sometimes you have to, but um, still, I think, I think that really narrows down what's, what's possible and what, what's smart to do in this, in this music. At least, you know, in, in the suite, um, 
I thought was important. Um, and that's, you know, some people may disagree, but because Schoenberg was not um, necessarily a pianist the way Liszt was, for example, um, I think it's probably more common to have to redistribute certain things between the hands. You know, some things that are written for the left hand may be just so much easier if you take them with the right hand and vice versa. Um, personally, I think he wouldn't have cared. Um, it, it looks to me, you know, when, when you play through this music, it looks like somebody who is a non-pianist sat down and really tried to make sure that it's playable, but as a, but, he, but he's not, not a pianist, you know? Um, Ligeti is the same way, you know? His music is very hard, and you can tell that he really sat down and tried to see that it was playable, and then it's still hard. But the same is true for Schubert. You know, I, I don't know a single bar of Schubert that's comfortable. <laughs> Right, I agree. I agree. Hundred, a hundred and fifty percent. It just has to be this way. It's just that's that's part of the character of the music. Um, yeah. To me, I find it Im immensely endearing that that it's it's awkward. I think it's part of the expression. It's part of it's the nature of the music, and sometimes certain adjustments that really do not change the music, but but simply make it mm -hmm. more approachable. If you if you change the distribution of the hands, um, I think in this music is totally okay. So I try to make some suggestions which hopefully work for people um, in that in that direction. And we I'm should, sure it is. It's and, very helpful. And, yeah. and, and we probably should add that, of course, this is just suggestions. And and right. for anybody studying this music, it should feel absolutely free to say, boy, that was really a stupid idea on the part of, of the guy, and I'm going to do this. I, that's completely normal and, and, and totally personal, as Shai says. So, yeah. so just, you know, by, by no means is this, is this anything written in stone. May I also add that, that you, Norbert, have been amazing in clarifying a lot of the stuff that I got wrong. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> And, and and making sure that 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 it all got correct and obviously you are very in, involved in this and you can play all this stuff with no trouble at all so thank you well, so much for your for your help with this well thank you <laughs> thank you but uh, but that's not really part of the uh, difficulty i think <laughs> i think it's difficult to in, invent fingering and it's always the easier part to to edit fingering and to try it and to 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 think about okay what could be added here or there so um, well it's my pleasure <laughs> so um, so to close i was wondering if each of you could just uh, close with a very short statement why should we study or why should we play the suite opus 25 or wh why should we study and play the pieces opus 11 and 19 well um I would say that the Suite Opus 25, to all our colleague pianists out there, um, it's a much more effective piece than you think. Um, <laughs> there are, there are uh, many ways to program it in intriguing ways. It can spice up any recital program, and it's extremely re rewarding to play, um, physically and musically. Yeah, and I think I think for me for the uh, opus opus eleven and opus nineteen pieces, uh, they're just beautiful expressive music that that should be played as as much as as much as anything that's that's normally played. I, I, I just <laughs> I, I I believe that it's that it's wonderful wonderful music. Of course, opus nineteen is <clears throat> is a fabulous. It's it's six minutes long, I think, and it's a fantastic program interlude between, let's say, a Mozart or a Beethoven sonata in a first half. It's a fabulous opener for a second half. It's incredibly uh, sensitive, uh, atmospheric, beautiful, and touching. Uh, and and I think that's that's. Opus 11 is is just beautiful romantic music that can be played instead of playing three Brahms intermezzos. There's no reason you can't do this. And it would be exciting and, and different. So for me, it's a, it's a, it, as one would say, a no brainer. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much to both of you. Thank you for doing this interview with us and thank you for contributing to our editions. And I'm really very happy and proud to have both of you in our project. Thank you very much. It's, it's an honor. It's an honor for me, I know. And, and I'm sure that's, yeah. It's a great, great privilege. Um, as a kid, you know, every music that I consumed for the piano had the familiar blue cover blue on it. Um, <laughs> it means, yeah. means a lot to be part of this now. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. See you soon.